This fireplace is just an eyesore. It's in desperate need of a redo, and I've waited long enough. A year prior, I opened up the living room wall and removed an ugly piece above the mantel. We also painted the room and put in new baseboards. So this room has already gone through some renovations already, but this fireplace is just awful. So here's how I turn this into this. We finally decided on a design and it involves rotating the entire living room. The TV has been living against this wall, but with this renovation, I moved this entire entertainment center to the fireplace. The TV will be up on the wall and I'll build a custom gaming mantle to hold all the electronics and gaming consoles. There won't be any visible wires, a feature that I'm a bit nervous to execute, but I know that if I do it right, it'll look really good. The first step of the process was to dismantle the existing fireplace and mantle. This project had to be fluid because there were a lot of unknowns. I didn't know what was behind the mantle. I didn't know what was behind the wall. I didn't know for sure where the studs were, etc., etc. This is part of the reason why it took almost a year to scrounge up the courage to start this project. And right off the bat was the first problem. Behind the mantle was just more brick. There wasn't any way for me to exactly know how this newly exposed brick plays into the rest of the fireplace chimney structure. But one thing for sure is that I was not gonna risk knocking it down. That meant leaving all the brick in place. It just meant having to do a small redesign to account for this space. What's funny is that there are three different kinds of brick involved in the fireplace. Someone wasn't picky enough when this was first built. When I first put in the new floor molding, I knew we were gonna do something to the fireplace, just not sure what. However, I purposely put the molding in so it could easily pull off the pieces closest to the fireplace without damaging or disturbing the rest of the molding on the wall. I started guessing where the studs were behind the wall. I have a stud finder, but it doesn't work well on these plaster walls. This gave me an estimation on where to put a few outlets. Since all the wires will be hidden, I had to have outlets and access ports sit against the wall on the inside of the mantle. When I cut out the first outlets, I hit my second problem. There was a massive header beam directly behind the wall. That'll make putting electrical outlets there a little bit difficult, but as you'll find out later, not impossible. I also cut a test hole behind where the TV will go. With this hole, I could get a peek behind the wall to see where the studs were. Knowing where the studs are is important when it comes to mounting the TV. The first thing we wanted to do was whitewash the fireplace. This could be a bit messy, and it would be much, much easier to do before doing any of the building. We started by taping around the fireplace and laying down paper to protect the floor. Next, we used some sandpaper on the brick to eliminate any rough spots. This also helped clean the brick because over the years, it had gotten some spots and stains. I didn't want to take any risks to have those show through the whitewash. We did a very thorough vacuuming and cleaning before putting on any paint. The first step for whitewashing was to paint all the mortar with solid white paint. We used interior semi-gloss white. Slowly but surely, we painted all the lines. Just by doing this, the fireplace already looks better and much less dull than before. It's already starting to pop. I've never whitewashed brick before, but did plenty of research beforehand. Here's what I did. I mixed roughly 50% semi-gloss white paint, 50% water, and mixed thoroughly. We tested the mixture on one of the bricks that would eventually be hidden to make sure it wasn't over or undersaturated. Then, we worked together to apply the whitewash to the bricks. I painted it on as my wife used a rag to wipe it. The mixture is pretty runny, so if it wasn't wiped, it would look like it was just runny paint. It was also important to wipe any paint that had dripped to the bottom of the wall. If it sat there too long, it could dry and be a permanent spot. The brick on the wall was very porous, and we noticed that the paint was soaking into the brick and changing the look after a few minutes. So, I had to go back and reapply the mixture. I'm glad this was the case because once the paint goes on, there wasn't an easy way of taking it off. I tried to apply it unevenly to give the whitewash some texture. The base of the fireplace was much different. This brick was not porous at all, so wiping away the paint was very important. I painted it on liberally, and she wiped it away almost immediately. Since there are two different kinds of brick visible, we wanted the color to look as identical as possible 
so the bricks would blend together. After applying paint to the entire fireplace, we still thought there was too much red showing through, and wanted it to be more washed out. So I ran over the entire thing a second time, making sure to really hit any spots that were heavy red. I'm glad it went like this because, like I said before, it's really easy to add more paint than take it away. It's much better to wash it out in phases than to be SOL because it's too washed out. The next step I took was rough in the wiring in the wall. I ran Romex down from the attic as well as new coax cable. These cables were long enough to run through the attic to where they'd connect into their systems. I purchased a TV mount and used the template that came with it to mark precise mounting spots on the wall. Since it could be holding a significant amount of weight, it needed to be mounted on studs, but still be centered over the fireplace. Now that the mount was figured out, I could relocate the boxes behind the TV. One would be an outlet to power the TV, and the other an access port for HDMI cables and such. Behind the mantle would be three boxes, one for power, one for the coax cable, and the last box is the other end of the HDMI access. Since I knew I'd be covering up this area with shiplap, it was easier to cut out big chunks of wall instead of individual rectangles. With a bunch of the prep work and planning done, I could begin construction on the fireplace surround. The first step was to install support studs on either side of the mantle. A normal stud measures three and a half inches wide, but the fireplace only stuck out about three inches. So I ripped the boards down to size. I pulled up some of the paper and tape on the ground so the stud could sit directly on the floor. I first used a normal wood bit to drill a few holes in the stud. When I punched all the way through, it left a mark on the brick. I then used a masonry drill bit to continue the holes in the brick, making sure I drove straight in and not at an angle. I put these holes in the middle of the bricks, not too close to the edge or too close to the mortar, or else I risked cracking the brick or not making a good holding place. When that was all ready, I used masonry screws to connect the wood to the brick. I did the same process on both sides of the fireplace. Since I was creating some weird dust, I kept the vacuum handy to clean up the mess. I did a similar thing on the top of the mantle, except I used a 1x4 instead of a 2x4. The reason for the thinner board is so the mantle can sit as low as possible. I followed the same steps with punching pilot holes in the wood and brick before driving in the masonry screws. All these pieces I put on so far will never be seen when it's all done. They're in place purely for structural support for nailing in the next pieces. Now I could start making and installing some of the pieces that will actually be seen. I was super picky when buying this lumber. It had to be super straight without any bows or twists and had to be clean with little to no knots or dents. I spent a while digging through the stacks at Home Depot to find the best looking boards. These 2x10s needed to extend to the floor and overlap the brick. I carefully marked and notched out the corners to fit cleanly on the brick. If the 2x10 was only connected to one stud, it would easily flap around. So I ripped another stud and put it on the far side flush with the edge. This will also act as the support for the side faces. Once it was all level, I nailed everything solid with finished nails. I even drove some nails through the stud into the wall to keep that from moving. If any nails didn't quite make it in all the way for whatever reason, I used a punch and hammer to push them a bit further in. I followed the same steps on the other side. Here, you can get a better look at how the stud supports the other side of the front face piece. With as many nails as I used, this thing wasn't going anywhere. It was okay to use a bunch of nails here because most of these would get covered up with trim pieces anyway. Now is the time for the last major face piece. Before I go any further, take a look at this line right here. This is a wooden strip embedded in the mortar. It's a nail strip that was used to connect the old mantle to the brick without using adhesives. It'll come in handy for this next step. Installing this board correctly was extremely important. If this piece was unlevel, then the mantle would be unlevel. I made sure to check and recheck several times before popping in any nails. 
If the two vertical pieces on the sides were slightly out of level, you wouldn't notice. But if the mantle was off, you'd definitely notice. When it sat as true as it could be, I put nails into both the nail board at the top and the nail strip embedded in the brick at the bottom. Next, I installed the side faces. These would overlap the ends of the front pieces and sit flush with the front. A trim piece will eventually cover that front seam. I tried to hide as many seams as possible to make the final product as clean as possible. The trick with the side pieces is that they had to sit exactly level with that middle piece. For these would guide the ends of the mantle to make it sit level as well. <laughs> Already this thing is starting to take shape. It's cool to see its potential. Okay, this is when things got a bit frustrating. In my design, I put trim around the front of the fireplace. There's a bit of an overhang at the base, so I needed to put in backers to support the trim. No big deal, just do the same thing I did before. Drill some pilot holes and screw the pieces to the brick. Easy peasy. Yeah? Uh, <laughs> no. This brick did not want to be messed with. It kept fighting back and sheared or stripped every single screw that I tried. I was baffled because it just didn't make any sense. Well, eventually I gave up on screwing the pieces in and just used some heavy duty construction adhesive instead. Not my preferred method, but it'll definitely get the job done. I used a few clamps to hold the pieces on as the adhesive set. One of the last major pieces to put on is the top piece. This could act as the mantle, but it's really just a shelf for the real mantle. I made sure it was center and nailed it into all the pieces below it. Next, I gave everything a really good sanding to hide any imperfections at the seams up to this point. If anything was off, it would definitely show when the trim goes on. Okay, trim time. The fireplace was already looking pretty cool, but the trim really gave it that character and depth that it needed. I started with the boards around the floor. This was a bit tricky because the edges of the brick is not a perfectly straight line. I used some thin drywall shims where necessary to bring out the boards to the perfect spot. I mitered the corners for the cleanest look. I just took my time and worked slowly to play with different variations of the shims to see what looked the best. I waited until all three boards around the front were cut and shaped to fit, then glued and tacked them in together with wood glue and brad nails. Next, I worked on the trim board around the corner. The first piece was merely a backer to push the real trim board out a bit. Here, you can see a minor imperfection. The board on the left sits at a slight incline because of the brick. Not a problem though, because I scribed the next piece to hide that seam. Everything was connected with glue and nails for a solid hold. On both sides, the outside corners were mitered. Okay. The next step was to add detail trim to the face of the surround. I ripped my own strips of trim two inches wide on the table saw. I needed these trim boards to look as clean as possible. Most of the time, these boards have dents and dings along the edges because of how they've been handled. I first trimmed off just a sliver to make a clean edge. I then used that new edge to guide along the fence and cut the wood into two inch wide strips. I put these strips on as strategically as possible to create as few visible seams as I could. I started with the outside so the sides were solid pieces. Next, I did the top bar so that was a solid piece. Then I did the inside vertical pieces, making sure they were flush with the inner edges. I followed that with the lower horizontal bar, again making sure that sat flush with the edge. And finally, I went through and completed all the lines and boxes with four small pieces. And just like that, we have a brand new custom made fireplace surround. There's still so much to do to finish this thing, but dang, does it look good already. Even unfinished, it's still a step up from that bland red fireplace and old timey mantle. Stay tuned for part two as I put shiplap on the wall, wire everything up, and put on all the paint. Okay, that's it for now. See ya.